So this is the last, uh, the last sort of application of differential equations we'll see for a while, because it's the last sort of standard application that doesn't require more advanced techniques. So we'll do this, we'll spend the next whatever, 10 weeks, just sort of learning methods, and then we'll go back to applications at the end of the course when we have a wider or a larger toolkit. The, the application in question is one I've mentioned a few times. Velocity with air resistance. So in count to this one and count to this two, we always do problems with velocities. It's kind of less, less new. It's kind of the standard first application we always see the derivative of position is velocity the derivative of the velocity is acceleration and then when we get to antiderivatives okay the antiderivative of acceleration is velocity the antiderivative of velocity is position all of those problems assume that we do not have any kind of air resistance. And let's look at a calculus problem in the sense that it doesn't involve air resistance. Let's say a crossbow bolt is fired up words from ground level with an initial velocity V sub zero equals 49 meters per second. Let's find the velocity function and the height function. Uh, in calculus, we tend to use S for height, but our textbook is using Y, so I'm following our textbook here. Well, this is anti-differentiation. In fact, we've basically, we've done examples like this, our lunar lander example. The velocity, well, the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration and the acceleration isn't given in the example, but it's constant near the Earth's surface, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So the velocity function is negative 9.8 T, thus our constant of integration. And our constant of integration is this initial velocity. So negative 9.8 T plus 49. And our height function, the derivative of the height is the velocity so and we're integrating these i mean i guess i didn't say that explicitly but these are differential equations that can be solved 
explicitly using integration, our constant of integration, I'm not forgetting it, our initial height is zero. So let me, we're going to come back to this problem at the end of the day, and we're going to introduce air resistance. So let me get this, let me get a graph of this right now. I mean, it's nothing particularly exciting. You've seen, you've seen parabolas before, let's see, negative 4.9 T squared plus 49 T. Let's fix that. And let's, so let's mess around with our viewing window a bit so that we can see this whole thing. That's step Y. So there's the height function. Goes up, goes down. We're neglecting air resistance. Let's look at the height of a rising or falling object. In the presence of air resistance. So what we're using here is one of Newton's laws. The mass of an object times the derivative of the velocity with respect to acceleration equals the force. I mean, Isaac Newton, sort of inventor or co-inventor of calculus, also, of course, a major physicist. He was working with calculus so that he could talk about motion mathematically. Um, in the absence of air resistance, force is negative mg where G is the gravitational constant, that 9.8 on the previous frame. So this law of motion, I want to say it's the second law of motion, is this. The masses cancel, and we get dVtt equals negative g. g is positive, 9.8. It shows up with a negative sign. As you see. So this is just what we get from Newton's law of motion. What if we have other forces at work? In other words, there's air, there's gravity. That's a force that's acting on this object. Air resistance is also a force that's acting on this object. So air resistance, if we include it, is gonna go over here on the differential equation. And force is additive. So if you have a force due to gravity and a force due to air resistance, you can just add them together to get the total of force. So the force due to gravity, we've already looked at, it's that negative, G M. The force due to air resistance 
is more complicated, and there's no one size fits all thing we can put here. Like, if something is traveling slowly, like by walking down the street versus something like a bullet, then air resistance is operating on me very differently than it's operating on the bullet. But it's frequently assumed that the force due to air resistance looks like that. Negative K times V to some power. Where the power is between zero and one. And for relatively low, I mean, not one, sorry, two, for relatively low speeds, E is often assumed to be equal to one. And when I say low speeds, I'm talking about things like my crossbow example, which I mean, you see a crossbow, it might not look like a very low speed, but for really low speeds, again, me walking down the street, you would just ignore air resistance. So this is low in the pantheon of speeds that are still fast enough that you would not want to ignore air resistance. And didn't that end up being a, being a phrase? But if we let T be one, then this law of motion, m times dv dt is negative gm minus kv. And if we divide both sides by m, dv dt, equals negative G minus K over M B. And finally, we don't normally write K over M. We normally write K over M as rho. So it's basically looks like a P might be kind of indistinguishable from it actually, but the Greek letter rho which is the coefficient of friction. So this is the differential equation that I would like to consider. And we're going to go ahead and solve this thing eventually. But um, since we've talked about fixed points and that was what we did Tuesday, why not look at this before we solve it from a kind of fixed point? Point of view. Um, this is autonomous. You see, there are no T's over here on the right. So we can ask about fixed points. And to find the fixed points, you set the differential expression equal to zero, and there is a fixed point, negative G equals rho V, negative G over rho equals V. So we do have a fixed point, first of all. It's maybe not immediately 
I mean, it's probably obvious by this point in our academic career, but it's maybe not immediately obvious that there should be a fixed point. I mean, you might think, well, falling objects accelerate, so the velocity should just increase forever. I mean, that's the story we tell children, right? When we're teaching them about acceleration, that if you drop a penny off of the Empire State Building, it will track the pavement. Totally false statement. It won't crack the pavement, and if it hits somebody, it won't seriously injure them. But this is a fixed point, and it's an asymptotically stable fixed point. So as time passes, our velocity does not just go to infinity. Our velocity is approaching some finite number. Um, this fixed point, as you, you may be aware, it has a name. This fixed point is called terminal velocity. If an object is allowed to fall for long enough, its velocity will approach some fixed velocity called its terminal velocity. Um, terminal velocity is negative. So, I mean, this makes perfect sense to us. Of course, if we throw an object up in the air, it won't keep going forever. It will go up, its velocity will be positive, then it will start to fall, its velocity will be negative, and if it falls for long enough, it will approach its terminal velocity. So another situation where we can get information about a system without actually solving a differential equation. Notice though, I mean, I like this fixed point. Well, I'm sort of sentimental about fixed points because I use them a lot in my PhD thesis. We do lose information if we're just looking at fixed points. So questions like how long does it take the object to approach terminal velocity? Questions like that, we can't answer just by looking at fixed points. So let's look at dv dt equals negative g minus rho. This is separable. Um, we'll divide both sides by rho, first of all. And uh, we'll divide both sides, sorry, by negative rho. So we'll get rid of this negative sign too, and we'll get V plus G over rho. This G over rho is going to stick around. Notice that G over rho has a very concrete meaning. This G over rho is, I mean, aside from the negative sign, it's the terminal velocity of the uh, object that is rising and falling. And now we'll complete. This. I mean, we'll just divide both sides by the right hand side of this equality. Uh, and we'll have 
a DV. And then on the right, we'll just have that DT. And we will integrate both sides. These are the last integrals. Uh, the last integrals we're going to take in this class practically. So whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. We, uh, we get this when we integrate. I mean, we're essentially doing a tiny U substitution here. U equals V plus G over rho, DU equals DV. And then the integral one over u du is the natural log of u. So we are going to solve for v. And this is just going to be every time I say just, it's in scare quotes. This uh this algebra is kind of ugly, but it's just going to be algebra. We'll multiply both sides by negative rho. We're going to keep row C. Um, at the moment, that constant of integration is just some completely arbitrary constant. So we could argue that rho times a completely arbitrary constant is a completely arbitrary constant. I think it's going to be convenient down the line if we keep this. And we can exponentiate both sides. V plus G over rho is e to the negative rho t, e to the negative rho c. And then we'll bring this G over rho over. And in a sense, we've solved this. No, no muss, little fuss. It would be nice if we didn't have that C. Um, I mean, in the sense that that C is a completely com um, arbitrary constant of integration. And it's the only thing in this problem that doesn't mean anything. I mean, G is a gravitational constant. Rho is our um, coefficient of friction. T is time, V is velocity, C is nothing. C is just some completely arbitrary number. So what we're going to do, this is, I mean, this is a trick, but we're going to take T and stick it. We're going to take this equation. And we're going to let T B is zero in this equation. And when T is zero, let me silo this off. We get negative one over rho times the natural log. Now velocity is a function of time. It's not, a P, I mean, time isn't appearing explicitly in the formula, but velocity is a function of time. 
So if we're letting T be zero, we're letting velocity be zero. And this is now a specific value of the function. It's a V of zero. We're going to rewrite V of zero as V sub zero. On the right, T is zero, so we just have C. And now there are surely better ways of doing this, but we'll get there in the end. Multiply both sides of this equality by negative one over rho. So negative rho c equals this natural logarithm. So what we have there is e to the negative rho c, but e to the logarithm, the e and the logarithm will cancel out. And that e to the negative rho c will turn into v sub zero plus g over rho. We still have this e to the negative rho t. We still have this g over rho. And now we have a velocity function without, I mean, without any meaning this constants. Again, G gravitation, rho friction, V sub zero, initial velocity. So the point of this rewrite is to get rid of that C which doesn't mean anything, and replace it with something that does mean something. Replace it with that V sub zero. So there is, I mean, there is the velocity. When, um, when we're not neglecting air resistance, but also when air resistance isn't too overwhelming. So like fast, but not too fast. Crossbow bolt kind of fast. And that's, um, let's find the height function. We found, I mean, uh, speaking of crossbow bolts, we found the height function um, neglecting air resistance. Let's find the height function not neglecting air resistance. And then we can uh, compare the two. So finding the height is more, uh, is just integration. It's actually this this from this probably looks uglier than um than what we started with. I mean, this thing in the box probably looks uglier than this, but it's going to be easier to deal with because of where the variables are. Here, your um dependent variable was on the right. Here, it's only our independent variable that's on the right. And we can just integrate this to solve it. We don't have to separate variables. Our variables are already separated. So we are working with V. 
equals V zero plus G over rho E to the negative rho T minus G over rho. And this V, this velocity is the derivative of the height and we are integrating both sides and we're getting that the height is negative one over rho times V zero plus G over rho times E to the negative rho T. Again, this looks uglier than it is. I mean, this is just a constant times e to a negative constant times t. It's not a particularly tricky integration. Dr. Moses, yeah? question for you. Yeah. Is the negative g over uh, rho, is that in the exponent with rho times t or is that by itself? That is by itself. Just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. So speaking of, when we integrate a constant, we just get that constant times t. And then we have our constant of integration. And again, we're in a situation where we're sort of done, but we, we could do better. I mean, if I tried to take a crossbow bolt, and I told you what the coefficient of friction is, it would still be hard to use this equation because we have that mysterious C floating around. And we don't know what C is real world significance is. So same trick, we are, uh, we let T be zero here, and we get that Y sub zero, the initial height is negative one over rho times V sub zero minus B sub. So in my notes, I changed this a little. I said, well, negative G over rho has a very concrete meaning. It's the terminal velocity. So in my notes, I rewrote this a little, I said, okay, what we have here is the terminal velocity. And likewise here we have V sub zero minus the terminal velocity. So I ended up with a slightly different looking expression, mathematically equivalent, of course. And then if we let T be zero, we get, you know, V sub zero minus V sub tau, E to the power of zero is one. V sub tau times zero is zero plus C. And then we use this to rewrite Y. Y equals Y sub zero plus V top sub tau times T plus one over rho 
times V sub zero minus V sub tau times one minus E to the negative rho T. This is by no means obvious, I should say. I definitely did a double take when the textbook went from here to here. And I mean, we're not doing any to see to see that these are the same. There's nothing really clever that you do. You start by taking this y sub zero and plugging it in there. Then you factor everything out in the second equation. You factor everything out in this first equation. And once everything is totally factored out, you can just go through and say, okay, yeah, this term appears in both the equations. This term appears in both the equations. All of the same terms appear in both the equations. I guess they really are equal. It's definitely a lot less, uh, a lot less obvious than when we did it on this frame. But here is your height function. Let me write this again. Y equals Y sub zero plus V sub tau times T plus one over rho V sub zero minus V sub tau times one minus E to the negative rho t. And let's remind ourselves that V sub tau is negative g over rho. There's height. And we've managed to get this so that all of the constants that appear in this equation have some kind of concrete meaning. We've got the coefficient of friction, we've got gravitation, we've got the terminal velocity, V sub tau, we've got the initial height. We no longer have any kind of mystery constant C. And let's take this equation. I'm going to be erasing and messing around with this. So does everybody have it written down? Let's go back to our crossbow book, crossbow book. Um, So a realistic coefficient of friction, if you just fire a crossbow bolt straight up, is 0 0.04. So let me take this, and let me, I should have, should have got in our calculator up earlier, but Let's go through this and negative rho t is negative 0 0.04 t. This is definitely the kind of thing 
that an elementary school student could do, but I somehow am really bad at. One divided by 0 0.04 is 25. Let's get this back to the default line with V sub zero. I gave V sub zero in the first frame. I said, suppose this is firing with an initial velocity of 49 meters per second. Let's see. I said it was firing from ground level. So the initial height is zero. This term just goes away. V sub tau is negative G over rho. Let's round this to just a few. Decimal places, negative 9.8 divided by 0 0.04. Oh, you can tell when a problem is uh, taken from a textbook because everything works out so nicely. Uh, one of um, negative 245. So minus negative two, four, five, that's 49 plus two, four, five. Two hundred ninety four. So hopefully if everything, if we've done everything correctly, it's so easy to make little errors in these problems, but hopefully if we go to Desmos and I guess I could simplify that but whatever, Desmos won't care. Hopefully, if we go to Desmos, we'll see something that looks realistic. So let me see. Negative two, four, five, P. We're gonna need a Y equals. plus 25 times 294. Times one minus E to the negative 0 0.04 T. Beautiful, exactly what I was expecting, more or less. So initially, you know, things look identical. Air resistance is kind of cumulative. So 
for the start of the flight, we're not really seeing any difference between these, but as time passes, air resistance is an opposing force. So the arrow is trying to go up, but air resistance is keeping it down. The result is that we have a maximum height that is smaller than when we neglected air resistance by, oh, about 14 meters. And we reach the maximum height sooner, about 4.558 seconds versus five seconds. And then the object falls. And um, as the object falls, air resistance is again um, opposing it. But even though here, the fall is being opposed by air resistance. Here, the fall is not being opposed. We can maybe kind of see that from the graph, that this parabola is a little steeper going down than this parabola. But in any event, the arrow with air resistance hits the ground sooner, 9.411 seconds versus 10 seconds. Obvious, what a, what a nice arrow to reach its height after five seconds exactly and hit the ground after 10 seconds exactly. And it's, early, but as far as I'm concerned, that's probably about as much air resistance as anyone wants to see. I mean, there are all sorts of things we could do to make this uglier. Like we're treating gravitation as if it's a constant, 9.8. Gravitation isn't a constant. It varies depending on how close to the center of the Earth you are. So if we were like trying to send a rocket to the moon, you would have to look at how the gravitational constant G changes over time. Um, we're treating a mass as if it's a constant that could be just canceled out. Again, maybe mass isn't constant. Going back to a rocket ship, mass certainly isn't constant. It's burning fuel and it's shucking off its various rockets as they're used up. So there are all sorts of things you could do to these problems that would make them more complicated, I think. I just wanted to see one more application before we move on to what will ultimately be applicable, but will seemingly be unapplied material for the next 10 weeks or whatever. I don't want to, I don't want to make this stuff overstay its welcome. So Early or not, we'll call the lecture here. And next week, we'll start looking at some very different material.